Hello and good evening everyone. Thank you for tuning in to Nottingham RCG branch meeting tonight. Why did Corbynism fail? We will be going live at about six o'clock and um, until then I'll be leaving you with the sounds of our educational podcast um, which you can see you can find on the link on the on the screen now. Um, don't forget to like, share and uh, subscribe and um, spread this on to anyone who you would be uh, who you think might be interested in it in getting involved in building a revolutionary movement. We'll be live at six o'clock. In class will never allow the system which maintains its domination to be wished or voted away. It will take a revolutionary struggle led by the working class. Let's move into the required reading for part one. This article, called Fight Racism, Fight Imperialism is 25 years old, is from issue number 182 of our paper FRFI, published in December 2004. In it, David Yaffe sums up its contribution to the struggle for socialism in Britain. The name of our newspaper itself is a political statement. It declares that fighting racism and imperialism must be at the heart of any socialist movement in imperialist Britain. It is a position that has directed the political theory and practice of the revolutionary communist group for over 25 years. From our first issue in November, December 1979, a consistent revolutionary anti-imperialist standpoint has determined the political content of FRFI. The core positions have not significantly changed, but have been expanded and made more concrete as political experience and practice has forced us to develop them. The political outcomes of struggles has often been different to what we had wanted and expected. The optimistic outcome that we fought for has frequently been set back by the opportunist forces mobilised against any militant working class or anti-imperialist movement. We have confronted such developments and learned the hard lessons from them for future struggles, as can be seen from the pages of FRFI. What are these core positions? First and foremost, at the most general level, we are Marxists and materialists. The capitalist system, by restricting production to the narrow limits of profit making, is a crisis ridden system. It can never satisfy the basic needs of the vast majority of humanity. Capitalism necessarily turns into imperialism, a worldwide system of brutal exploitation of the oppressed nations by a smaller number of rich, powerful, capitalist nations. With the majority of the world's population living in poverty, while a small minority squanders unprecedented wealth. As a result, capitalism creates the seeds of its own destruction. Forces from among the working class and oppressed which have an interest in overthrowing it and replacing it by socialism. A system which organises the production of wealth on a socially organised basis. Our understanding of capitalism allowed us to recognise from the beginning that globalisation was not a new stage of capitalism, but a return to those unstable features of capitalism which characterised imperialism before the First Imperialist War. There has been a frenetic international expansion of capital, which has had devastating consequences for the vast majority of humanity. Far from being a beacon of unhindered capitalist development, as many left intellectuals have maintained, globalisation is a sign of economic decay and increasing instability in a world of obscene and growing inequality. It has led to wars and will inevitably bring resistance and revolution. FRFI is published in the oldest imperialist country, 
The imperialist character of Britain has been decisive in determining British economic and political developments. Britain is still a major imperialist power, second only to the United States. The high monopoly profits that a small number of imperialist nations derive from the super-exploitation of oppressed nations make it economically possible to create privileged sections of workers in imperialist countries. These workers, a labour aristocracy, constitute the social basis of opportunism. Imperialism creates a split in the working class. The upper stratum of the working class now dominates the British labour movement and ties it to imperialism, the economic foundation of its status and privileges. The labour aristocracy expresses itself politically through the Labour Party and it controls the trade union movement. FRFI has always regarded the Labour Party as a racist, imperialist party. Alone of the main publications on the British left, FRFI called on workers not to vote Labour in the 1979 elections and has consistently argued this position over 25 years. FRFI was able to point out what the Blair Labour government would be like before the 1997 election. Seven years of an openly racist, imperialist and warmongering Labour government have underlined the fact that no anti-imperialist or socialist movement can be built unless the British left makes a fundamental and irrevocable break with the British Labour Party. Imperialism is at the root of racism in the world today. Racism is the form national oppression takes in the imperialist country. The imperialist nations brutally exploit and impoverish the oppressed nations, then erect a barrier to keep out immigrants, refugees, asylum seekers, fleeing from the resulting war and poverty. FRFI has always opposed all immigration controls and the RCG has played a central role in many anti-racist and anti-deportation campaigns from the Erlington Family Defence Campaign against police brutality in Islington, North London in 1980, through the four-year-long Manchester-based anti-deportation Viraj Mendes Defence Campaign in the 1980s, to the anti-racist marches in Haringey, North London in 2001. At the time of our first issue, British imperialism faced a growing political and economic crisis. This found expression in the war in Ireland, the assault on the liberation movement in Zimbabwe, British support for the racist government in South Africa, the racist offensive against black people in this country, and attacks on working class living standards, in particular, the offensive against the public sector. In all these cases, it was the oppressed masses and poorer sections of the working class who were bearing the brunt of the attack and who were fighting back and resisting. From these developments, we drew certain important political lessons, which are guiding our political practice today. Precisely because of the daily experience of their lives in Britain, of British state brutality and repression, of poverty wages and unemployment, the oppressed sections of the working class will have few illusions about the character of the... Hello everybody, thank you for signing in today. We are the Nottingham branch of the Revolutionary Communist Group, and today we will be talking about why Corbynism has failed. We will be shortly having um, two introductions from the comrades you can see to my left and to my underneath. Um, we'll be having comrade Despine talking about um, the recent developments around um, what happened in the election last year and the rise of um, Sir Keir Starmer to the leader of the Labour Party. And we'll also be having Comrade Ruby talking a bit more about the history of the Labour Party. Um, has it been a socialist party? How has it played, you know, what role has it played historically? So I'll now hand over to Comrade Despine. So I'll now hand over to Comrade Despine. Yeah, thanks for that, Matt. Let me just get my... Yeah, so um, tonight I'm going to be talking about um, why Corbynism failed and like what it represents for the British left going forwards. 
Um, so 2019 was a painful year for the left of the Labour Party. Despite advocating a politics for the many, Labour had its worst electoral result in decades. There were many parts of the manifesto which were rightly criticised, but this was interspersed with some truly progressive demands. The creation of a national care service, along with the nationalisation of utilities and some critical infrastructure, would have been positive for the working class in Britain. So why did Labour lose the general election? And why was the 2019 manifesto a curious blend of reactionary and progressive politics? In addition, why did Corbyn get replaced as leader by Keir Starmer, who has already begun his task of removing Labour's left from positions of real influence? Answer both these questions and we'll conclude the discussion must do in order to be successful. Um, it, it, excuse me, it's been, I think we um, lost a few um, frames. I could just repeat the last sentence, please. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so I aim to ask, answer the questions of uh, why Labour lost the 2019 election, what the, um, and what socialists need to do in order to be successful going forwards. So it is undeniable that the general election of December 2019 was a disaster for the Labour Party. Um, there is no other way to look at the facts without distorting reality. With a total of 202 seats out of a possible 650, Labour lost a net total of 60 MPs, including many of their supposed safe seats across the North and the Midlands, and posted their worst results since 1935. All this despite a decade of savage Conservative Party cuts into healthcare, education, welfare, transport, and virtually every other governmental expense possible. Against a party led by a sexist, racist, homophobic, self-aggrandizing buffoon, whose only entitlement to political leadership was that he went to Eton and Oxford, this election presented itself as the most open goal for any even mildly competent party. Any party which was led by a true red who had a claim to the mass support of the working class as Labour claimed to in the run-up to the election should have won in the landslide victory. That Labour did not ought to be the final nail in the coffin for any hopes of a parliamentary road to progress. This then raises the question, of why did Labour lose the election so heavily? The answer comes from an analysis of the electoral coalition which Labour needs to appeal to in order to win. On the one hand, there is one privileged section of workers, the Labour aristocracy, primarily found in the public sector and administrative work. These people have essentially been bought off by the super profits of imperialism and recognise that their relatively high standard of living comes about through the exploitation of the underdeveloped world and immigrant labour. On the other side, there is another bulk of privileged workers who, while income poor, are relatively asset rich. These people are tied to the individualist politics of Thatcher through her expansion of privatisation and right to buy schemes and make up the majority of the electorate in this so-called Red Wall. They see the threat to their privilege as coming from uncontrolled immigration and large amounts of public spending and will fight to protect their position from these perceived dangers. Nowhere is the tension between these two privileged layers more evident than over the Brexit question. The matter of Brexit was essentially a dispute between different factions of the ruling class with no progressive outcome. Because of Britain's decaying position as an imperialist power, there arose the question of whether the future of British imperialism is better secured by being a usury supporter of US imperialism or through further integration within the European imperialist bloc. For the Labour aristocracy, remaining in the EU was seen as the only way to maintain their privileges, while the Thatcherite layer saw European immigration as a threat to their interests and so opted for a British nationalist position, which would have led to British imperialism playing a subsidiary role to American interests. By not giving a conclusive support to either option in an attempt to appeal to both layers, Labour instead alienated large sections of them. Simply put, Labour failed to be reactionary enough for the Thatcherite layer to vote for them, while not committing itself enough to a defence of the Labour aristocracy's privileges. These two backward sections of the working class find themselves diametrically opposed, and under present conditions, an electoral coalition cannot be successfully built off them. The only solution is to dig down lower and deeper into the real masses of the working class to fight for radical change. But this strategy is not a strategy for electoral success and so cannot be taken by Labour. 
So we now have our first taste of what Corbynism looks like in practice, but we have not yet answered the question of what the central features of this political development were. Corbynism was not a particularly new kind of politics, but an attempted return to the mass public spending which dominated the imperialist world following the Second World War. Unfortunately for Corbyn, the material basis for this spending no longer exists because Britain is a decaying imperialist power. A national care service, the nationalisation of utilities, transport and internet are all progressive demands, but with the present lack of an economic foundation on which to build them and the militant organisation of workers to fight for them, these proposals were never going to become a reality. Rather than building a fighting anti-austerity movement on the streets, Corbyn channeled his followers into the respectable path of electoral politics. Following his election as leader in 2015, Corbyn, along with Shadow Chancellor John MacDonnell, penned a letter in that December to all Labour councils to vote for legal, i.e. pro-cuts, budgets. At a subsequent Labour Party conference in 2016, it was then made a disciplinary offence to vote against or abstain on austerity budgets. As a result, not once in the last 10 years has a Labour councillor in Nottingham voted against cuts. Corbyn and his supporters believed that government could be used to just shower benefits on the working class willy-nilly, without any kind of fight against the amassed forces of capital. Corbynism was, therefore, a process of the calculated demobilisation and de-radicalisation of any insurgent working class movement. On every substantial question, Labour under Corbyn bent over backwards to prove that they would be a safe pair of hands for British imperialism. Corbyn maintained Labour's commitment to the imperialist NATO alliance. He refused even to question this matter, despite it being raised by the Green Party, and so pledged a minimum of 2% of GDP on military spending every year, which included the renewal of the Trident nuclear weapons programme. On immigration, Labour argued that the Conservatives had somehow been too soft and had weakened Britain's borders, promising additional staff for the racist UK border force. Plus, policing saw similar accusations against the Conservatives, with a commitment to 2,000 more frontline officers than had been planned by the Conservatives, which means more racist harassment of immigrants and their descendants and more attacks on the working class. At every opportunity, Corbyn gave in to every attack, slander, smear and criticism brought against him by the ruling class, advocating increasingly more reactionary politics at every turn. He proudly proclaimed that he was not a fighter, and he demonstrated this on every question. As Prime Minister, it was clear that he would have lacked the backbone to challenge the profits of the care, utility and transport providers who would have reacted against any attempts to nationalise their businesses, and he explicitly misdirected any social movements which might have fought for them. As such, he would have failed to deliver on the progressive sections of his manifesto. Corbyn made the decision not to fight and forced that position on anyone in Labour. Nowhere was Corbyn's cowardice and opportunism on greater display than in his capitulation to ruling class and Zionist allegations of anti-Semitism and of his abandoning of the cause of Palestinian self-determination and their right to resist in all forms. 2019's supposedly most radical manifesto was, in fact, a step back on the question of Palestine for Labour. The 2017 manifesto argued for an end to the blockade, occupation and settlements, and said that Labour would immediately recognise the independent sovereign state of Palestine. Fast forward two and a half years, and this position had changed to a viable Palestine alongside a secure Israel. While the 2017 manifesto was itself marred by the opportunist and pro-imperialist politics of Labour, the 2019 statement was an utter capitulation to Zionist interests, which claimed that any criticism of Israel is by definition anti-Semitic. Israel, and by extension Zionism, are crucial to maintaining British imperialism's influence over the Middle East and access to the resources present, which is why British governments of both parties have committed themselves to the defence of Israel. This so-called crisis of anti-Semitism within the Labour Party it's little more than the fact that some Labour members have expressed a degree of sympathy for the experiences which the Palestinian people go through on a daily basis. As a colonial idea, Zionism is fundamentally opposed to any position which recognises even a small amount of injustice done to the occupied and oppressed people of Palestine, as it threatens the very foundation of its legitimacy. 
it is not anti-Semitic to say that the foundation of Israel was a racist project when it required the expulsion of over 700,000 Palestinians from their homes in 1948 alone. Yet Zionists, along with their ruling class allies in Parliament, Whitehall and the media, spread the absurdity that making a mere statement of fact was racism of the most profound sort. In the face of these attacks on Palestine's solidarity, what did Jeremy Corbyn do? Did he forcefully deny them as racist Zionist attacks on Palestinians? Did he decry them as attacks on free speech and the right to stand in solidarity with Palestine? Did he make any defense of the rights of Palestinians to return to fair treatment in political and justice systems, to self-determination, to resistance against all kinds of oppressions? No, he did not. He once again bowed down in the face of ruling class pressure, promising to remove all anti-Semitism from the party, by which is meant by the Zionists, the removal of all Palestinian sympathizers, because nothing less is satisfactory for that. Even the full adoption of the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, IHRA, pro-Zionist definition of anti-Semitism, was not enough for these brutal supporters of the occupation. The recent leaked report into Labour's internal handling of anti-Semitism demonstrates that the party officials deliberately worked to remove all pro-Palestine sentiment from the party, which the new Corbyn would not oppose because he was more concerned with keeping the party together than fighting for justice. That all of the candidates for Corbyn's successor fully endorsed the Board of Deputies of British Jews' 10 pledges to fight anti-Semitism should be one more reason in the long list to refuse to support Labour. These 10 pledges turn over Labour's disciplinary procedure to an external Zionist kangaroo court. The demand from a non-Labour affiliated organisation that Labour only engage with mainstream Jewish, that is to say Zionist organisations, ought to have been rejected by anyone with the care for the independence and democracy of political groups. Each candidate, in their own unique style, their Zionist colours, in an attempt to court the patronage of the Zionist leaders and their ruling class allies. Starmer has already pledged to tear out the poison of anti-Semitism by its roots from the Labour Party, rhetoric which can only mean a mass expulsion of pro-Palestine members. Yet, as Asa Wynne Stanley noted in an article for Electronic Intifada, not be enough for the Zionists. The campaign against anti-Semitism has already declared that the real test of whether Starmer is taking anti-Semitism seriously will be through disciplining Corbyn himself as an example to all Labour Party members. Not satisfied with destroying him in the election, removing him as leader and cementing the next decade of Labour policy as a proudly Zionist party, these virulent anti-Palestinian racists wish to see a symbolic end to Corbynism and Palestine advocacy in Labour itself through Corbyn's expulsion. Is, so is Starmer going to rescue the Labour Party and deliver them to new electoral heights while ushering in a new age of popular democratic socialism for the British masses? No, he won't. The Right Honourable Sir Kia Rodney Starmer, Knight Commander, the Order of the Bath, Queen's Council, Member of Parliament for Holborn and St Pancras, leader of the Labour Party and leader of Her Majesty's most loyal opposition, will present no opposition to the British bourgeoisie. Already he has called for collaboration with the Tory government in enforcing a repressive response to the present coronavirus pandemic. He has made the call not to go for so-called political point scoring, instead preferring to work with a party which has systematically underfunded the NHS and care services, ignore the, device of the advice of the WHO, and fail to act on a 2016 report which demonstrated that the NHS was woefully unequipped to deal with a major influenza-like epidemic. Keir Starmer was appointed as Director of Public Prosecutions, DPP, during Brown's government in 2008 and retained the position until 2013, making him the third most senior prosecution official in Britain and head of the Crown Prosecution Service, the CPS, including during Cameron's opening salvo of austerity measures. It was for his time as DPP that Starmer was knighted for services to law and justice. It looks like seeing in a reactionary and oppressive regime which tramples over people's rights in order to defend a rotten bourgeoisie. I will give just some examples of the horror. 
Sorry, which bit did you want me to go back to? Yeah, sure. So it was um, for Starmer's time as the director of public prosecutions that Starmer was knighted for services to law and criminal justice. But what did this enforcement of law and justice look like under Starmer's leadership? Apparently for Starmer, justice looks like seeing in a reactionary and oppressive regime which tramples over people's rights in order to defend a rotten bourgeoisie. I will give just some examples of the horrors of justice under Starmer. The 2008 inquiry into the racist murder of Jean-Charles de Menezes was a whitewash, and Starmer refused to open prosecutions against any officer involved. Starmer refused to prosecute officer Simon Harwood, who killed Ian Tomlinson in 2009. He refused to act on the issue of police infiltration of activist groups, which was possibly occurring under his own direction. Following the 2010 student protests, Starmer set out guidelines for prosecutors to attack those who came with articles to cover their death. Um, during the 2011 London riots after the police's racist murder of Mark Duggan, Starmer praised the efforts of over 1,000 most black and poor young people. Starmer's CPS refused to invest. MI5 and MI6 agents suspected of collaborating with the CIA in tactics of extraordinary rendition and torture in Afghanistan. CPS prosecutor investigation into Julian Assange. With Chancellor George Osborne's crackdown on the so-called benefit cheats in 2013, Starmer rushed through prosecution directions that placed these instances on, under the Fraud Act, which meant that even the most trivial of so-called offences could face up to 10 years imprisonment. As MP, he abstained vote on the welfare bill, which cut benefits to the most vulnerable. He, he voted for the Investigatory Powers Bill, or Snoopers Charter, uh, even pushing for cross-party support to get the measure passed. And finally, he voted against an inquiry into the Labour government's lies leading up to the war on Iraq. Starmer's shadow cabinet is no better, filled with much of the same reactionaries as might have been found in a Blair or Brown cabinet, including Rachel, Labour is not the party for people on benefits, Reeves. Starmer put three out of the four other leadership candidates into shadow cabinet roles, notably putting the proud Zionist Lisa Nandy into the role of shadow foreign secretary. Rebecca Long Bailey finds herself as shadow education secretary as a sop to her and Labour's left flank. Ed Miliband somehow sees a return to Labour's front, brand, front bench as Shadow Business Secretary, which was a surprise to me, given that I wasn't aware he was even still in politics until last week. And of course, this is the same Ed Miliband who pioneered the controls on immigration monks. It is, therefore, abundantly clear that Starmer has assembled a shadow cabinet around him, which will not challenge British imperialism's brutal policies around the globe, and which will not fight for the, work, for the rights of the working class at home. From all I've said, it should now be evident that Labour has demonstrably chosen the path of reaction. It has chosen reaction through its election of Starmer to leadership and its capitulation to Zionist attacks. And Labour needs to choose reaction in order to gain the patronage of a reactionary layer of workers who put the maintenance of their privilege above all other concerns and thus secure an electoral coalition capable of producing a majority of seats. This leaves the left-wing movement in Britain with a choice. Does it remain attached to the Labour Party, or does it strike out on its own independent path? Already, figures such as Owen Jones and Paul Mason are claiming that people should remain in Labour and fight to change it from within, a position buttressed by the editorial positions of The Guardian, The Tribune and Jacobin. But these people do not care about the long-term interests of the working class, and certainly not of workers in oppressed countries. For them, as long as British imperialism continues and is capable of supporting their relatively privileged lifestyles, then they will fight to protect a party which defends their interests and will do everything they can to head off any potentially radical movement which might jeopardise their position. For any person who wishes to see an end to austerity, to racism, to war, the utter defeat of Corbyn's project should be a confirmation that there is no parliamentary road to socialism and that Labour is unreformable is unreformable. 
Corbynism swelled the ranks of the Labour Party just to hand it over to a man who will pursue a policy as reactionary and as regressive as the last Labour government. Leftvoice.org wrote on the defeat of Corbyn and Sanders that the strategy of going to the bourgeoisie like Oliver Twist and asking if, pretty please, can we have some more workplace safety and protective equipment will not be sufficient for the task at hand. Only class struggle will win us what is needed to combat the public health and economic crises. This means making a decisive break from the Labour Party and their reactionary pro-imperialist pro for. If we wish to defend and extend the rights of working people here in Britain and around the world, then this means building a radical insurgent organisation of working people on the streets and in our communities. We must be clear that we stand with all oppressed peoples around the world in unconditional solidarity and we must be willing to fight for every inch of progress wherever that struggle takes us. Cool. Thanks a lot for that, um, Despine. That was a very interesting talk. It really showed some of the main um, issues that are at stake in the coming period as we're seeing um, a lot of turmoil in the Labour Party with the outcome of the new leadership election and particularly the um, dossier that was released over the weekend. Um, so shortly I will be handing over to Comrade Rui, who will be taking a slightly longer view of the um, questions involved. Um, so, Ruby, um, I'll hand over to you in a second, and when you want to um, show the slides, just let us know. And um, just a quick reminder to everyone out and about watching this, um, we want to hear from you. Do you have any um, questions? Do you have any recent experiences with the Labour Party? Are you in the party now? Have you ever been in the party? Um, do you have any questions about what the comrade just said? Do you have any thoughts about it? Um, and it also really helps if you could let us know where in the world you are and if you could like and share this to help us bring these revolutionary politics to as many people as possible. Um, and there's links in the chat so you can get um, involved with our mailing list and you can support us by getting the latest issue of Fight Racism and Fight Imperialism. So with that being said, I'll um, hand over to Comrade Ruby. Hi. Yeah, hopefully you can hear me. Um, yes. So I'm just going to, I might not be able to see all of my slides. So if there's something on there that I can't read, then yeah, just deal with it. Hi, everyone. Yeah. So my part of the introduction is going to be going into the more um, historical and background to the whole development of the Labour Party and what it's been throughout its history um, in order to get to the root of some of the political um, analysis that Despine just spoke about. Um, so yeah, some on the left argue that Corbyn's leadership of the Labour Party was part of a return to a tradition of Labour's roots as a kind of a really socialist party. Um, but what I will be showing is that that is not the case. Um, so Matt, if you show the first slide, hopefully that will work. So I'm going to be drawing massively from an excellent book that's on the Labour Party's history, which is by Robert Clough. Um, it's called Labour, a Party Fit for Imperialism, and it can be bought on our website, which is revolutionarycommunist.org. Um, and it really is a really thorough um, analysis of the real history of the Labour Party, which I had no idea about before I ever read it. So I really recommend people to buy it and read it for themselves. If they want to read it for themselves, they should. So the Labour aristocracy, benefit benefactors of British capitalism. So first, I'm going to talk about the foundations of the Labour Party in its historical context briefly. Um, to trace it back to its roots and see the development which can help us understand what it really represents today. I'll aim to demonstrate that Labour's roots began firmly within a developing privileged layer of the working class, which is referred to as the Labour aristocracy, with its unions of skilled workers with higher wages and other privileges. So from 1850 to 1875, British capitalism dominated the world, expanding rapidly, dominating world markets. 
and its industrial expansion and productivity levels rose and wages as a share of national income declined, but real wages began to increase. So by as much as a third for some. So this included the developing labour aristocracy specifically, who they were um, skilled craftspeople and skilled workers who made up just 10 to 15 percent of the working class. But their wages were approximately double that of the unskilled workers who were the massive workers. During this period of huge growth for the British bourgeoisie, they could easily give concessions. So it wasn't threatening to their political or economic power. And it was actually quite effective at tying this the layer of the working class, this labour aristocracy, who led the workers' movement politically to tie them into supporting the continuation of British capitalism. So, yeah, the next... Uh, slide should be one that's talking about cooperative societies with a quote from Engels that's really good. Um, so these skilled workers set up influential craft unions which paid full-time officials um, for the first time and charged high subscriptions for benefits like sick pay and unemployment benefit for their members. They also set up cooperative societies, which meant that those who could afford to pay for shares in these societies got paid dividends and interest on share capital. But unskilled workers were completely um, unable to take part in this because it was too expensive, basically. Um, so it was only available to those workers who were already in a privileged position. So this was all part of the process of this labour aristocracy gaining a stake in the British capitalist system and becoming tied to supporting its continuation. So the next section I'm going to talk about is um, British imperialism. So even when British industry began a relative decline with growing competition from a burgeoning US and German capitalism, which were beginning to um, outcompete it, British capitalism turned to its colonies in order to defend and expand its profit, its riches. I will return to the horrors of the British Empire and its reality in a later section, but this plunder, again, was used to bribe the Labour aristocracy into continued support for the British Empire and the British ruling class, who they relied on for their privileged position. So as the US and Germany overtook Britain, in production of the world's coal, iron and steel, for some examples, um, the lack of competitiveness of British industry was expressed through a falling domestic rate of profit. So now began an era of huge investments, um, huge investments overseas to make profit for British capitalism. Sorry, my computer just did something weird. Um, yeah, so now the next slide should be up. Yeah, cool. So what this amounted to was that between the years of 1870 and 1913, that approximately £2,400 million in exported capital, which was used to create monopolies in the colonies for British industry to draw profits from, with a net income back to Britain, of 4,100 million pounds. So while British capitalism became less competitive and less profitable, it parasitically depended on colonial monopolies to stay afloat. This plunder from the empire was used to keep this developing labour aristocracy in comparable conditions to the middle class, while the mass of other workers, the unskilled workers, women workers, agricultural workers, were generally paid half or less of their wages and were three times more likely to be unemployed or casually, seasonally, or otherwise temporarily employed. Poverty was the norm for these workers. So, for example, a 1905 study called Riches and Poverty by Sir Leo Chiozza Money estimated that 33 million from a population of 43 million lived in poverty, including 30 million living in destitution. I'll give some figures at the end that's to do with poverty today. Um, so, yeah, the next slide um, has some figures on it from riches and poverty. The trade unions and political life were still dominated by this labour aristocratic layer. Other than the miners in particular, trade union membership tended to be mostly made up from 
the old craft unions and mostly using their funding for the benefits of the workers in them rather than strike pay or lockout benefit, for example. So, for example, in 1889 to 1890, when a massive surge, there was a massive surge of unskilled workers becoming unionised. Mm. So, for example, um, gas works and dockers, the trades councils were hostile to the reliance with Irish revolutionaries and Marxists and their revolutionary action, like the dockers strike, arguing that workers should use the ballot box to change things. However, this was clearly to the exclusion of the masses of all women workers, lower paid casual labourers and dockers who did not who did not have the right to vote. By 1900, these new unions had begun to organise to exclude the mass of workers in favour of those with more stable positions and better incomes to remain part of the trades union council. And with that, having their paid members who had a, priv a privileged existence on the basis of getting dues paid by better off workers. So the next bit I'm going to talk about is um, some ideological influences on the Labour Party. Um, so the Independent Labour Party, which is in many ways like the forerunner of the Labour Party, was formed in 1893 after a split from the ruling Liberal Party. Those workers who made up the Independent Labour Party were drawn from the same layers as the trade unions, the skilled and better off working class or labour aristocracy. They didn't appeal to unskilled or slum dwelling workers or those who were periodically unemployed, but to the lower professional middle classes and radical liberals with a variety of wealthy donors like Cadbury of Cadbury's Chocolate, which supported the Independent Labour Party. So you can imagine what radicals they were if that's who wanted to donate to them. Um, the next slide has got a quote from Sydney Webb, um, which I will talk about. So a major part of their membership, this is of the Independent Labour Party, and ideological influence came from the Fabians, who were an organisation of middle class socialists formed in 1884. Uh, the Fabians rejected the class struggle and held the working class in complete contempt of which nothing could be expected but crime, meanness and brutality. They became increasingly involved in the independent Labour Party and local elections to improve municipal services in the fear of uprisings in the festering conditions of the toiling millions. But Sidney Webb, who um, should be on the screen now, who would come to be described as the intellectual leader of the Labour Party, and rightly so, explained that the Fabian's interest in improving the standards of living for the most destitute workers, the 8 million or one fifth of the population in 1901, who were living in destitution, was to, quote, breed and maintain an imperial race and was not, quote, merely or evenly, even mainly for the comfort of the workers, but for the success of our industry in competition in the world. So obviously demonstrating that their belief was not in um, changing the system for the benefit of the workers of the world, but was for basically making British imperialism more um, competitive. By 1910, British industry competitiveness was declining to the point that even the Labour aristocracy was losing privilege and its secure position. As unemployment amongst trade unionists rose and wages went down, yet the craft unions failed to defend against this with strike action, which fell to a record low in 1904, which, incidentally, is um, similarly abysmal today. Um, the levels of strike days lost were absolutely abysmal recently and with the austerity that has been happening it's very clear that the same issues with what the trade union represents is a similar question and class character as it was then. So the last four years leading up to the First World War saw a huge wave of action by the British trade union movement Strikes of seamen and dockers in 1911 and railwaymen and miners in 1912 brought millions of workers into action. And in Liverpool, there was a near insurrection against the army, who, which was led by Tom Mann, who was later jailed for supporting an appeal for the army not to fire on workers. The Labour Party condemned these actions and the radical working class leaders of the movement 
and attempted to um, separate them off from the rest of the movement, tried to isolate them. And four Labour Party MPs even put forward a bill to make strikes illegal unless 30 days notice was given. Um, though this was rejected by the TUC Parliamentary Committee, it demonstrated that even this early on in its history, Labour would stand against the working class as a whole. So the next bit I'm going to talk about is the 1918 Constitution, um, which this is something that often gets held back to as if it um, demonstrates the real socialist character of the Labour Party. Um, but what in fact is often missed out is some things that I'm about to tell you. So after the First World War, Britain emerged still the leading European imperialist power and would be the vanguard of the counter-revolution against developing international socialism. The growing unrest in Britain and political impact of Russian revolution meant the ruling class had to concede to the vote for all men over the age of 21 and all women over 30, which more than doubled the electorate by 1922. This meant that in order to be a parliamentary force, Labour must expand its appeal from the affluent and small layer of the Labour aristocracy and some layers of the middle class. And this inevitably meant trying to appeal to the newly enfranchised section of the working class. So there should be um, a cartoon is the next slide, which is just a bit tongue in cheek, but it is a cartoon that kind of represents what the workers were being asked to do by giving their power away to a political party that didn't represent their interests. It's quite a good cartoon, I think. Um, so yeah, and then clause four of the new 1918 constitution um, written by Labour and a programme called Labour and the New Social Order was set out in this attempt to appeal to the new working class electorate. They were both written by the Fabian and social imperialist Sidney Webb and the supposed radical content of them is used to praise the socialist roots of the Labour Party to this day. Though Clause 4 called for the fruits of their full industry to go to workers, um, they often qualified it by, they qualified it by saying by hand or by brain, which was deliberate, I think deliberate, deliberate in that context. And though they called for common ownership of the means of production and equitable distribution, in Labour and the New Social Order, it's also littered with reassurances that this is not a class proposal. This reassurance is aimed at promoting an alliance with the ruling class and middle class socialists, more along the lines of reform to benefit those better off workers and their cooperative societies, rather than a revolutionary programme to destroy the capitalist state. So while the programme called for a minimum wage, nationalising mines and railways and power supply, progressive taxation and some form of welfare from the state, what is never seemingly raised or mentioned about the supposed progressive content of this programme is its blatant racism and hypocrisy. As with one hand, it offers welfare, security and democratic reforms, with the other hand snatches those exact same rights away from the mass of the working class in the rest of the world through the support of the maintenance and development of the British Empire, which is in the document. The Labour and the New, the new Social Order programme referred to co colonised people as non-adult races. Its vague statements about being for local autonomy and home rule all round meant nothing in practice and in the document they outrageously claimed we seek no increase of territory whilst Britain was in possession of the largest empire the world had ever seen. So the next section is called Labour Party Defenders of British Imperialism um, which is a very important point to talk about because it is the thing that's often glossed over as if it's not important but it's the key thing to understand what Britain is and how it functions um, and what its relationships are to the rest of the world and how a, an actual socialist movement has to deal with that question first and foremost in an imperialist country. So as I've shown in the first part of this talk the Labour Party was set up to defend the interests of a privileged and small section of the working class whose privileges depended on British imperialism. 
This next section, I will give some examples to demonstrate how the Labour Party has defended British imperialism to show that the Labour Party and British imperialism are inseparable and they, defend, they pen, depend on one another to survive and have done throughout its history. <coughs> the First World War, the First Imperialist War, though Britain was at first in no immediate danger or threat of attack, it needed to settle the German challenge to its colonial monopoly. So Labour leaders had been denouncing the war and calling to resist it, but quickly fell in line with the trade unions and ruling class to mobilise for war and attack conscientious objectors. In 1915, Arthur Henderson's Labour Party joined a coalition move, a government. The Labour Party issued hypocritical statements decrying German imperialism being a threat to independent nationalities and threatening the destruction of democracy and liberty in Europe, whilst British imperialism ensured there could be no democracy or liberty in its colonies. The extent of this empire and its absolute plunder and parasitic exploitation is often glossed over as like a relic from the past. But this relationship set up the very basis for Britain's continuing parasitic domination of countries all around the world to this day um, and the way that they built up the wealth and the vast resources that have been sucked into the city of London. The British Empire encompassed huge swathes of land, resources and 500 million people kept in poverty, destitution or starvation with no control over their destinies. All this was used to enrich British imperialism and the ruling classes and, as we said, um, the Labour aristocracy in Britain. To defend this vast empire, the Labour Party both praised the Tory government's use of force to put down revolutions when they were when they were supposed to be in opposition and when they were in power, well, also they would make um, some criticisms of the way that it was being done, but not of the content of what was actually being done. Um, and when they were in power, they used a veneer of socialist and democratic language whilst either manoeuvring to betray revolutionary movements um, or as well as using the same outright murderous force to put them down as the Tory party did. So I'm just going to give a few examples, um, but there are many. And again, I would really recommend people to read the Labour book because it's full of horrific examples um, that I think it's important that people know because it's the real history. So the Independent Labour Party published declarations against the uprising in Ireland, which led to the Irish Republic being declared in 1916. And Labour MPs applauded in Parliament when they learned of the execution of the leader of the uprising, James Connolly, by the British War Cabinet. They imposed an agreement in 1920, which meant in practice the partition of Ireland and the continuing terrors of military occupation for many years to come. India would also remain under British imperialism's grasp under Labour. From India was extracted one million members for the army for both the world wars mm. with millions of pounds plundered through forced loans and increasing exports of corn and wheat during times of famine. No matter that 12 to 30 million Indian people died due to famine and flu between 1918 and 1919, India was too important for British imperialism to lose control of it. So Labour did not oppose the government's attempts to repress and control the masses in India and agreed that most should not have the vote as, quote, natives would not understand the significance. When in power in 1924 and again in 1929, the Labour government passed repressive legislation after repressive legislation, detained left-wing revolutionary leaders um, in order to prevent Indian independence. Between 1929 and 1930, between 60,000 and 90,000 people were arrested. Hundreds were killed or wounded by firing and the RAF had dropped 500 tonnes of bombs on India. By 1931, the Round Table Conference was set up by Labour. This was in order to offer petty concessions and um, to the Indian bourgeoisie movement and in order to demobilise the masses and the potential revolutionary struggle against British rule. They ensured that the Indian liberation movement was dominated by a developing Indian bourgeoisie, which would be cooperative with imperialism. And again, the partition of India in 1947 was the ultimate result of this treachery. 
George Orwell at the time wrote an essay condemning those who were championing the supposed superiority of British democracy by conveniently forgetting to count the hundreds of millions of colonial slaves whose abject conditions made such a democracy possible. So the next part I'm going to talk about is um, the 1945-51 government, um, because again, this is something that's often held back to as some sort of example. The outbreak of war in 1939 thrust Labour into another coalition government, this time with the Churchill coalition of 1940. They were again needed to mobilise the working class for war. They supported the war unconditionally, despite the way that it was carried out, which was to first secure British imperialism's interest in the Middle East and the Mediterranean before committing the necessary resources to defeat German fascism in mainland Europe. The next Labour government of 1945-51, to 51, led by Clement Attlee, is often hailed back to by figures on the left, as if it is some socialist example from history to which Labour just needs to return. This is why it will be my final example to analyse and show that this was not the case at all. At the end of World War II, imperialism was in a serious crisis. Movements for democracy and national freedom were springing up across the colonial and semi-colonial world, backed up by organisations ensuring the promises of the Atlantic Charter would be upheld. Much of Western Europe had been destroyed or bankrupted by the war, while China, Malaya, Greece, Yugoslavia and Vietnam struggled for their independence from imperialism, and those ones were led by communist parties. British imperialism was in an especially weakened state. Its external debt was £3.65 billion, and much of this debt was to the US, the dominant imperialist power. So it, it had to rebuild. But if, it's, if it lost its colonial empire, this would have to be done at the expense of the British working class, which would risk social upheaval. It needed to appear to offer independence and democratic concessions to colonial and semi-colonial peoples whilst maintaining control in reality. To give this democratic facade a Labour government was needed, as Churchill and his Tory party had so openly declared opposition to Indian independence and dissolution of the empire. The moderate reforms this Labour government made to nationalise the banks, cable and wireless communications which these proposals, anyway, were supported by the Tories, and the rationalisation of electricity into the General Electricity Generating Board was not opposed by private companies or individuals from electricity companies, as they were paid hugely over-generous compensation, and as were those who'd been stockholders for coal and gas. The railways and canals were, anyway, so run down and in need of massive investment and were needed for maintaining the profits of British industry, which is why they were also nationalised. This was in order to defend British capital as a whole. There were welfare reforms made, including the creation of the National Health Service and National Assistance Act, which were, um, you know, landmark reforms. But in order to pay for such a reform, under Labour, the empire was milked for dollars and super profits, with any resistance murderously crushed and put down. Um, yeah, I'm showing this image here because the horror of this left-wing era, supposedly, of social imperialism should not get written out of history. This is the reality of imperialism and we have to face that if we want to progress away from it. We have to be honest about what it is. So... I'm going to give some examples here about um, resistance being crushed. So British troops in alliance with fascist forces suppressed the revolutionary government in Greece and installed a puppet government. And the US ultimately was had to come in and destroy the movement in 1949 once it became too expensive for Britain. 20,000 British troops under Labour direction were sent to the newly declared Democratic Republic of Vietnam in 1945 mm -hmm. to impose martial law and summary executions to open the way for a French colonial coup, costing 30 years of war and millions of Vietnamese people killed. The Labour government invaded Indonesia to restore... Well, the Labour government used 
um, its army to invade Indonesia to restore Dutch colonial rule of Indonesia using RAF bombing and tanks against youths that were armed with bows and arrows, killing 40,000 people. Puppet regimes and British troops were used to secure British imperialism's interests in the Middle East to retain control of its oil reserves. And Malaya was pillaged of rubber and tin reserves, earning net hundreds of millions of dollars for British imperialism from exports to the US. Organised resistance by workers in Malaya was put down with brutal force. Workers were gunned down, arrested, leaders were hanged, and the Labour government set up concentration camps and used headhunters to terrorise the population. This all shows that the reconstruction, the state welfare and nationalisations which the Labour government of 1945-51 to 51 enacted, were only possible with the plunder, oppression and murder of untold thousands of workers around the world. To argue it played a progressive role could only ever be based on the, view, the racist view that the lives of workers in the colonial world are of less importance than those in Britain. Um, so yeah, if you go on to the last slide. Um, yeah, this is the real history of the Labour Party and it shows why to build a real movement for socialism and progress, the working class urgently need to break from Labour and the British imperialism that it relies on and defends and join together with the mass of the working class around the world whose struggle they must take up as their own. So yeah, we're going to have be having some discussion and you can ask questions. Um, yeah, um, I'll send it back to Matt. Apologies, everyone. I was just talking to myself there. So um, I'd like to uh, just repeat myself. So what I was I was thanking Ruby for that excellent talk, talking about how you know the Labour Party has always in government supported British imperialism and supported British imperialism for a lot of the time. It wasn't in government as well. We saw there the um, you know the brutal reality of imperialism in Malaya, and we might not. Um, you know, we might expect that more from the 2000s and the new Labour government with the invasion of Iraq, but that goes through the whole history of the Labour Party. Um, so yeah, I'd now um, be interested to get any questions. Um, um, let us know in the comments. Are you in the uh, Labour Party now? Have you ever been? What do you think about the new leadership, leadership of Keir Starmer, who we were hearing about from um, Bespin has like, you know, made it his career to let the police get away with murder, let the police get away with, uh, you know, horrendous spy tactics. So I'm now, um, I seem to be being told that I'm still being muted, but I shouldn't, I shouldn't be. So I just um, uh, hopefully get some feedback on that. So while I'm trying to sort out those technical difficulties, um, I think it would be good to um, just point out that uh, how selective the outrage is over um, supposed racism in the Labour Party. A lot of the people who are saying that they have to 
um, fight the scourge of anti-Semitism in the Labour Party, had very little to say about Rachel Reeves, who said her political hero was Lady Astor, Nancy Astor, the second woman elected to the um, British House of Commons after um, Countess Markovich. And um, Nancy Astor was the main, one of the main supporters of Hitler in Britain. The group of Tories who supported Hitler in the 30s literally met at, at Astor's house. And Rachel Reeves obviously knows this, or she should know it. Um, and this is this is Rachel Reeves' political hero. So we can see how how uh, you know how real the uh, anti-racist politics are of um, the Labour Party. So um, yes, there's lots of good um, comments coming in. Um, Sean was very impressed by the talks and. Um, by Ruby's book collection. We're getting likes from Uwais, from Tassid, from Bob, from Gavin, from Annie, from Alessandra. Um, yeah, Clapham has raised that they were um, surprised by the image of Malaya. And um, yeah, you know, it is surprising because British British politics never, never talk about it because it's in the interests of the ruling class to cover this up. So yeah, people in the chat, um, let us know where in the world you're based. Let, if you, let us know if you've got any questions or thoughts. We've got um, some comments coming in from um, Susie, who is pointing out um, how people can get a copy of the book that Ruby was, um, was drawing from. That book is called Labour, A Party Fit for Imperialism by Robert Clough. Um, uh, thank you for showing us that there. So um, we've got a question in from Clapham. They're saying, what is to be done with regards to how do we mobilise the working class of the UK when a significant minority is essentially being bought off with the fruits of imperialism? I think that's a central uh, question. What do you uh, What do you guys think about that? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. Um, I mean, I think what... Like, the reason that this um, is on the cover, to me, is... So this is, like, an image from a march that was done by Focus E15, um, which is a movement that is still going. It's, like, a grassroots organisation of um, mothers and other people who are fighting for social housing, um, housing as a right, rather than a commodity. Um, and because of, so this was like in um, London, and basically because of their experiences in that they had to come up against the Labour Council that was trying to kick them out of perfectly good housing and saying that you have to leave the borough of Newham um, and go and live somewhere where you don't know anyone, otherwise you're voluntarily homeless. Um, and they were told, oh no, there's nowhere to live, when there was in fact housing that was being intentionally left to go bad, they came up against their Labour um, elected officials and they continued to fight because they knew, well, we're not going to, it's not going to get resolved by these politicians who are essentially living a comfortable lifestyle off the backs of working people around the world and in Britain. So ultimately, I think what we have to do is get in this well not at the moment because obviously we can't go outside that much but we have to get through to people and we have to be able to be organized for our interests the interests of the working class of the world for their right to be well housed and their right to be fed and their right to have a decent level of education and a chance to have a decent life because and we can also see that that's ultimately the different the differences and the impossibility of achieving those goals within capitalism means that people have to make that decision. And ultimately, people 
do make that decision and resistance will happen when people are pushed too far but it's our job to make sure that that doesn't get taken down a wrong path and brought into a useless dead end by thinking you can just vote someone into power who's part of a imperialist party who's just going to suddenly if you say the right thing or if you do enough rallies they're suddenly going to change their mind and say oh yeah actually let's overthrow the ruling class it's not going to happen so it's our job to build that class consciousness and to link up with things that are happening around the world yeah and i think you know if i can add to that something we have to be aware of is like where the struggles are happening at the moment you know for example like one of the big things which we're involved in um, is the environmental movement and link linking those kinds of concrete questions to like what is the history of british imperialism in terms of environmental destruction what is the role of the labor party in you know providing support um to you know destructive industries like the hp billiton and all the rest of them and in those conversations, in those like concrete movements, it is possible to actually radicalise people um, to an understanding of what British imperialism looks like and how we have to fight against it. Mm -hmm. Yep, thank you a lot for those guys. Um, yeah, there's been a lot of um, interesting stuff happening in the chat. It's good to hear that um, a lot of people are in uh, Nottingham. Um, uh, someone called Bob has raised that um, in Vietnam, the Labour government released and armed imprisoned Japanese soldiers, um, imprisoned Japanese prisoners of war to fight against the Vietnamese revolutionaries. So, you know, these are the high socialist principles of imperialist governments in power. Um, and Luke has said that um, they weren't aware of the extent of imperialism before the Iraq war. Um, we've got a question in from Seamus, which I think you guys have, um, uh, you might have slightly addressed it, but um, the question is, what would our speakers say to those who are advocating staying in the party in order to change it? And what about those who are advocating forming a new Labour Party because the current one is corrupted? Both angles are very popular on left on Labour left Twitter. So, um, yeah, what do you guys think about those two issues, staying in Labour to change it? or indeed starting a new Labour Party. I've seen the main um, example of that, you know, there's been loads of attempts at that um, over the past few years, the Trade Union and Socialist Coalition, Respect, um, and the Workers' Party of Britain seems to be a somewhat similar attempt. So um, what do you guys think about those questions? Well, I think we've seen what happens when people try and change the Labour Party. People said that that, that was what was going to happen when Corbyn took over the leadership. And we've seen what happens if you try and even be a social democratic voice within the Labour Party. What ends up happening is if you want to be um, an electoral um, success, then, as we've said, you have to appeal to re the most reactionary elements of the working class as well as the ruling class to show them that you're a safe pair of hands. If that's all you're willing to do, then look what happens. You get pushed further and further to the right. Um, you Look what happened. He capitulated on all the things that were important. What has happened now? That would Why would that be any different? That's all that's going to happen. So if you're real about what you want to do, we need to get real. Like you don't need to make another Labour Party because that's at the heart of it is something rotten that is not going to resolve the actual issues that are facing the working class and the people of the world today. It's urgent that we act and that we act consciously because the world is facing, you know, huge challenges like the coronavirus crisis and like um, climate, the climate crisis all of these crises aren't just springing up out of nowhere. They're directly coming from the global system of imperialism and the countries that are being able to deal with this, like socialist Cuba. That's where we have to look. We have to see, well, what, where has been successful at actually dealing with the things we're saying we want to do? Well, not the Labour Party. They didn't bring, a, you know, they didn't 
mean there was no war. They didn't mean there was no plunder in its past. Even the most progressive part that people are supposedly harking back to, we've just seen what that meant in reality for most people. Um, you know, the mass of workers who were part of the British Empire. That's not what the future that I think people want when they think they're fighting for something progressive. That's not what I want. So we have to think, how can we achieve our aims? And then we have to get real about how we do it and we have to get organised and we have to do it urgently. Yeah, I mean, there's an article in the previous issue of like racism by imperialism, our newspaper called um, The Legacy of Thatcherism, which goes into more detail about like the kind of um, electoral statistics, which I kind of uh, hinted at in my introduction. And it really does quite clearly lay out what kind of um, electoral coalition needs to be built in order to be a successful electoral party. And fundamentally speaking, that requires appealing to a reactionary Thatcherite layer um, of the working class. So being a, you know, an electoral party, one isn't going to achieve socialist change in the present conditions. And two, at a more theoretical level, the ruling class aren't going to allow their privileges to be voted away. Parliament isn't just going to expropriate um, private industry and private property into the hands um, of British workers just at the stamp of their fingers. That's not going to happen. So we do have to work and organise and be engaged um, in building power on the streets, which is capable of challenging um, the British ruling class here and capable of challenging British imperialism's hold on the world. Yeah, th thanks a lot for that, Despin. Yeah, I think it's really important to, um, you know, remember that the the question isn't just parliamentary struggle or doing nothing. We don't have to only rely on appealing to these, um, you know, to the most backward sections of society in order to build stuff politically. We need to appeal to people who are politically open, people who want to fight against oppression in all its forms. And it's our job as communists and socialists to try and, you know, spread a scientific socialist understanding of how to do that. Um, so um, Tony has raised an interesting question. Um, will the Western working class identify with the globally oppressed? Um, do you guys want to come in? Any thoughts on on why, you know, why they should? Um, stuff like that i have some thoughts on it yeah that's a good question i mean it's urgent that we do because if we if we do not then we're not going to succeed because there is no progressive there's no way there could be a progressive outcome to something that would happen in britain that's at the expense and without recognizing the links between what happens in Britain and what happens in the rest of the world and the fact that Britain is an imperialist power and its wealth is directly at the expense of the workers of the rest of the world. And I think I think people do. I think there are many examples of international solidarity between workers. I think the danger is clearly we live in a country that is... Um, imperialist and therefore massively racist and we have a media and everything surrounding us which is which is you know and also the racist immigration system and the racist laws which enforce that racism in reality and those are the things that we have to therefore explicitly fight against because it's not it's not just going to go away and the workers of the world won't just out of nowhere unite but we have to be conscious of what's constantly being you know that's constantly being used against us and also is being specifically used against different layers within the working class that's why our newspaper is called fight racism fight imperialism because the question of racism in an imperialist country is central it's absolutely key um so yeah anything that we can do to bring those struggles together um that is why we you know we constantly cover what's happening in the rest of the world 
um, in our coverage and we will always have demands included in whatever demands we have for what happens here. Like, for example, with our, we've been doing a bit of work around demands for the coronavirus um, crisis and like the absolute ridiculous mess that has happened in all of these major imperialist countries. Um, we have to demand that sanctions are lifted and the blockade is lifted off Cuba so that countries can use their resources to deal with this crisis. It is absolutely horrific and insane that we think we can say we live in a democracy while countries are getting sanctioned while there's a global pandemic happening. So yeah, I just had to uh, unmute myself before I started talking. Yeah, I think yeah, what you were talking about sanctions just there really shows the um the barbarity of the current um system. Yeah, we've got um we've got a question um from the oh we've got we've got a lot of good things in the chat. Um, Clapham has said, "I'm so frustrated with Corbynism. Five years of time, money, and effort for nothing, and in the meantime, the right of the party was sabotaging it all along. If all of that had been channeled into building institutions independent of the Labour Party, the working class in the UK would be more resilient, materially, and in opposite to the um, to the government." So yes, I think yeah, that's why. And we think a particular focus of that needs to be being particularly anti-imperialist because that is, you know, the main basis of the ruling class in Britain's power, um, which ties into what um, Comrade Ruby was just saying. We've got a question um, relating to um, what people think about the Labour Party's response to the current uh, coronavirus crisis. Uh, would either of you like to um, come into that? I know you mentioned it a bit earlier, um, Despin. Um, yeah, sure. So um, in truth, I haven't been paying that much attention to what Labour's been doing about coronavirus because it's been basically nothing what they've been doing. Uh, what they've been doing is they've been nodding along with all of the kind of like conservative proposals about things they you know, they nodded through an act which just drastically ramped up police powers in terms of um, interrogation and detention and like moving people along from localities. And that was just passed through Parliament without a vote, which is utterly horrifying to anyone who cares about democracy. And then, you know, we also have to take into account the fact that it has been Labour also who systematically underfunded the NHS. They did that in the early 2000s. They did that through um, the late 20th century as well. Um, I did have another point. I've forgotten what that point was. Come back to, I will indicate if I remember what it I know that um, Keir Starmer um, advocated for giving, or he's pledged his support for um, a campaign to give medals to NHS workers or key workers, which is just the kind of typical gross you know, militaristic, ridiculous nonsense. <laughs> and they and these, you know, like said, oh, you know, I want to be um well, you know, he's 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 basically said, I'm gonna be Her Majesty's loyal opposition, and that means basically being in a um in a crisis government where we basically just do whatever the Tories say and just maybe sometimes say oh well, we shouldn't quite have done that and it's absolutely insane because if there were any decent opposition they would have been shouting about the fact that the death rate is zooming up and that there's people dying in care homes and that people still aren't being mass tested and the fact that there's not the right laboratories even to do the right the kind of testing that is needed because of the fact that throughout, yeah, as we've said over this course of this history, that um, the NHS has been broken up, it's had private, um, you know, hands all over it, but they're not going to do that. Yeah, indeed. And they're actually helping the government, um, you know, cover up how deep the unpreparedness and how deep the neglect of the NHS goes. I saw on um, TV a few days ago 
uh, Lisa Nandy, who is now in the shadow cabinet, saying that this was an unforeseeable crisis where it was literally foreseen by the NHS. The NHS ran an exercise and found they were woefully unprepared. And so, you know, that's Lisa Nandy totally covering up for years of neglect of the NHS. Um, we have um, Chris is asking, how do we combat the division of the working class created by the middle class label? Um, class consciousness is brilliant, but a lot of working class people don't identify as such. So, um, yeah, do you guys have any thoughts on this sort of question of, you know, trying to organise around class when we have a very, you know, a lot of people have a very strange idea of what that means in our current society. I mean, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I get what you mean. I, before I became politically organised, I didn't really have an understanding of the class basis of these things. Um, but I don't think it's... It is, it's certainly like a, a question that you need to think about, but I don't think it's, personally, I don't find it too difficult because mm. when we're out and we're active and we're speaking to people and we're talking to people about real things and the demands that we have and the information that we're sharing with people about what is the basis of these issues that we see in our society I think it becomes pretty clear to people what they what they believe and like what they want to see change and I don't think it I don't think it's something that we should necessarily get bogged down with but I think we if you're if you're clear about what you think and you want to organize on that basis then you have to you have to do the learning yourself and then you also have to be involved in sharing the learning. And I think it's it's definitely something that can be achievable and that it's surprising how quickly people's consciousness can develop when you're engaged. Because, yeah, there's loads of things that I've learned that I didn't really know anything about until I became politically active, which in a way, in and of itself, is shocking that there's so many things that I didn't know before because... I've I've you know been lucky enough to go to university, but there's loads of things you don't get taught this. But you know for obvious reasons you don't get taught this in school. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, and like I think it does to an extent um, tell us like what ruling class ideology kind of like um, propagates that you know within like the popular idea, class is more a matter of income than it is of anything else, which blends the boundaries between like what the different classes are and makes it seem like it is more possible to be socially mobile which is a very common phrase when actually you know what the division of classes is is the matter of who owns the means of production and who works them and that class division is instantly a lot more rigid than what the ruling class want us to think so i'm not sure how we would go about it but we do have to challenge that kind of um idealistic hegemony and yeah like explain, you know, a Marxist analysis of class and of the division between property owners and the property workers. Yes, yes, I, th yeah, I think that is um, that is a very good answer to that question. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of um, a lot of interesting discussion happening in the chat. Do um, not be shy about letting us know what you're thinking in the chat. Don't be shy to give us a like and a share. And um, if you missed the introductions and you're wondering what we're all talking about, you can just zoom back on the live stream and then you can hear what we're all talking about. And um, yeah, so um, JJ has said in the chat that they're slightly embarrassed to say that they supported Labour when they were in the SWP and realising the Labour Party's role and the opportunist position of groups which claim to be socialist while supporting a party which disregards exploited workers abroad as well as in Britain really disillusioned them. And I think there are lots of people in the country who feel similarly. The question is, what do we say to them? And I, I think we've sort of covered the broad things about why 
we need to politically break from the Labour Party. Um, in response to the question we raised earlier um, from Tony, who said, can the British or the Western working class, Tony said, be in solidarity with the globally oppressed? Um, Seamus has raised that there are examples from British history in which the working class in Britain has sided with the oppressed globally. For example, the Chartists sided with um, the Irish Liberation Movement, which is a very, um, you know, a very big um, inspiration and uh, lesson for us. Um, there's been a lot of talk around parliamentarianism with um, respect to Venezuela. So um, there was, you know, in 1999, I believe it was, Hugo Chavez was elected president through like a standard bourgeois election. Um, and we would recognize that as part of a process of the Bolivarian Revolution, which we think is a lot different to what conditions are in Britain. So would either one of you want to talk about what those what those differences are and why it's such a different um, phenomena going on in Venezuela at the moment? Yeah. Um, oh, Despina, are you saying something? Yeah, I wanted to say as well about um, yeah other other more recent um, action that's like in solidarity with the oppressed of the world. Um, if you look at the movement in Britain against apartheid as well, you know that was a huge movement that drew um, black youths in Britain and white youths in Britain to support a movement against South African apartheid because they, and also like um, the RCG um, was involved in building a campaign against um, apartheid and the kind of message that was, that we brought to it was um, apartheid out of Britain and Britain out of apartheid because there was links, direct links between the racism of apartheid South Africa and the wealth plundered into racist imperialist Britain and the racism that was happening against, you know, black youths in Britain. Um, so I think people see the connections. Once people see the connections, I think it's quite hard to get rid of that. Um, yeah, I think like in terms of, of course, it's a, it is a really different situation in Venezuela. And, you know, we can see the ongoing struggle that there is in Venezuela against their own ruling class and their own, uh, you know, capitalist institutions that's going on to this day and the difficulties that have happened along that process, that revolutionary process. But I think the main difference is that Venezuela was not an imperialist country. Um, and, you know, we're not, we're not, um, I can't think of the word, but there's no, we're not predicting what's going to happen. We're not, we're not kind of, um, you know, we never said when Corbyn first came onto the scene, our analysis was, well, he's going to have to make a decision. If he really wants to take a stand on against the cuts, then let's see what he does. And let's see what, if he encourages the movement beyond supporting the Labour Party, because that's what would have been necessary to take that forward, then maybe things would have been different. But when it comes to being in a parliament, a parliamentary elected government in Britain, you're either going to have to come up against the work, the ruling class directly, or you're going to just kowtow to it. And if you do that, that is absolutely disastrous for the working class in Britain and around the world. Yeah, did you want to um, come in on that issue of Venezuela, Despin? Um, no, I think Ruby did cover most of it. And I think, yeah, I think, you know, there is beginning to be, you know, kind of factional hostility between like the different coalitions, the different groups within like this kind of parliamentary coalition, which uh, Maduro has coll collected around himself um, in the ongoing process um, of like the Venezuelan revolution, that there is kind of like 
a tension between like the more official state sanctioned groups of power and like more local, more proletarian um, expressions of political power and agency there. Yes, and I, I think that is a vital thing to bear in mind that, um, you know, one of uh, Chavez's main contributions was um, where he talked about having the commune or nothing, um, building up like direct um, power in the communes, in the rural areas, um, directly from the working class and peasantry has been a central part of the contradictory process that is the Bolivarian Revolution. And it's that sort of direct working class um, democracy and, you know, economic democracy, political democracy, that is totally alien to the sort of um, social democratic experiences in imperialist countries. Um, so, I, yeah, I think that's a key point. And, um, yeah, there have been some good points made in the chats. Um, Chris has asked, isn't Venezuela currently being sanctioned to hell because they won't bend to capitalist pressures? And um, Clapham has said, yes, that's totally correct. The ghouls and the Trump administration are frothing at the mouth to invade. And um, yes, and, and Clapham has pointed out, as I, I'm not sure if we mentioned that um, in Venezuela, they have the largest known reserves of crude oil, um, which is, of course, part of why they're such a big threat, as well as their socialist movement being inspiring all over the region of Latin America and indeed the world. Um, and I think, you know, while we're talking on the subject, it's worth um, reminding ourselves how Jeremy Corbyn in power, or, you know, in opposition, sorry, as leader of the Labour Party, totally failed to support the Venezuelan um, socialist movement when it was under its um, highest phase of attack in recent years. I believe it was in 2017, there was a new round of attacks. There were these um, very brutal, they were called protests, but it was more like, um, you know, it was more like terrorism where um, these people who were funded by the US were, you know, setting fires across motorways, um, beheading people um, and stuff like this. And um, Jeremy Corbyn, when challenged on it, um, on Channel 4, he said, well, you know, violence is bad on both sides. Um, and that's the the, cla the classical sort of, um, you know, home of someone who is too cowardly to take a position on whether they want the victory of a socialist revolutionary movement or an opposition that is, you know, funded by and works for the CIA. And, and Heidi has pointed out the very important point that um, Britain is also withholding a huge amount of Venezuelan gold. So it's, it's very easy when we're talking about Latin America in particular to um, think, oh yes, aren't the American imperialists bad? And of course they are. But Britain is also hand in glove um, with that process. Yes, um, Tom has pointed out on Facebook that the basis for the Bolivarian Revolution was mass organising against austerity from the 1980s. And a key moment following Chavez's election was when the people came down from the barriers to defeat the coup in 2002. So it's not just like it, it came out of some pious just wishing for an electoral solution out of nowhere. It was totally intertwined with wider working class action. And um, yes, Tom has also raised something that is um, very important to bear in mind, a, um, a fundraiser that is being launched. I'm just um, opening up the link now, I can't exactly see it. But it's, um, yes, that's it. It's the Steps Towards Socialism, which is a fundraiser that will be um, launching. We, well, we've just launched it now. And you can read um, some details about it in the chats over on Facebook. So um, please do consider contributing to that. Please consider getting a copy of our paper digitally, um, which has got lots of analysis of the coronavirus, cor excuse me, coronavirus crisis all over the world and how people are resisting it all over the world. So I'm just. Um, 
looking to see if people have any more questions that they want to raise, if there's anything I've missed. It's good to see we've got people in from Nottingham, from Liverpool, from Ipswich. Yes. Oh, yes, and an important point about um, part of why the Labour Party has proved so influential is due to the demoralisation of the working class and how it appears that no alternatives exist. And I do think that's a very important thing to bear in mind. Um, but it looks to me like we've addressed most of the questions that people have um, raised. Feel free to shout at me in the comments if I'm missing anything. So um, I just wanted to hand back over to um, Despine and Ruby to see if they had any, um, you know, rounding up uh, comments from what we've said so far today. And um, yeah, what messages we need to take on for, you know, moving the struggle to the future. Yeah, I think like on that last point you raised, part of the reason why it appears that there are no alternatives to the Labour Party is because Labour deliberately co-ops a lot of these alternatives. And that's kind of like part of like the entire role of what opportunism does is that it misdirects these radical social movements like the movement which could have built up um, around Corbyn on austerity, which Labour deliberately defanged. Um, yeah, I think the discussion tonight has been really good. It has covered like all of the important points. And it's that, yeah, the Labour Party is a thoroughly imperialist party. Um, and it has always been that way. That's you know the entire point of why Labour exists. So if we do want to see socialism in Britain, which I personally do, um, then we have to organise outside of the Labour Party in actual working class communities. We have to organise where struggles are occurring and build and bring into that an anti-imperialist, anti-racist perspective um, on all of these struggles which are happening. And that will eventually mean coming into conflict uh, with the Labour Party and all its structures. Yeah, I mean, I think now is a time to make a decisive break from the Labour Party if you're looking to make the kind of change that a lot of people are saying they want to see. And I think, yeah, um, like we've said, it's important to see exactly what we're doing and who we should be struggling on the side of because you often um hear this kind of thing that like labor lefties or whoever will use that's like oh you're dividing the movement or it's dividing the left to go against the labor party but in fact the labor aristocracy is a dividing force on the working class of the world and we need to get together and we need to educate each other and to organize together because we are the ones that are going to be able to deal with the crises that are happening all over the world and we see we see that it's possible because I think a really important thing that our newspaper covers and that we cover um, in an honest way is the achievements of Socialist Cuba which is a beacon of hope to people all over the world to show what is possible when ordinary people are in charge of production and they're creating their own reality because yeah there's there's huge crises that are happening and they're not going to stop happening they're going to keep happening because of the way that the world is structured so we have to if we want to see change then we've got to get organized so yeah I definitely rec um, recommend people get in touch with us if you want to get active if you've got an idea for something that you think that people need to be organizing around or you just want some more education or anything then yeah get in touch and find out how to get active yourself yeah thanks a lot for those um rounding up things um thanks a lot for chris who has sent a donation thank you a lot for that that really helps us to continue to try and forward this trend and try and build some organization Luke has asked over on um, Facebook, are there currently any specific plans for organising in Nottingham once lockdown is over? So in response to that, 
we don't know exactly when the lockdown will be lifted. So as far as I know, there aren't concrete plans for in-person demonstrations or meetings, but um, we are organizing online educationals and meetings of this format. So um, next Thursday, we'll be having a meeting in a similar format to this one, where we'll be discussing um, why housing is so precarious in this country, how that's been affected by the coronavirus crisis. And um, we're also running a series of educational meetings. Um, so the next one of those will be tomorrow. We're talking about why communist organization is so necessary. If you're interested in that meeting tomorrow, send us a message. And um, 